Yeah, today is the last day of summer. Uh, I hope you guys had a nice one. I think it was a pretty, pretty nice summer this year, I think, yeah? So, um, first day of fall tomorrow. I hope Washington doesn't do its thing where it just shuts off the sun and then here we go. I think it tried to over the weekend, but anyways, so... Uh, the cruises, we, we had a good time this summer, I think. Uh, we did quite a bit of traveling. We went over to Easter Washington, hang out with family over there. So that's always a good time. Um, because of baseball tournaments, we actually had a couple uh, trips out of state. And uh, it, didn't, it wasn't planned this way, but it, they ended up being uh, boy trips, cruise boys trips. And uh, we had a good time. Uh, went over budget, uh, like mom expected, but, uh, you know, I tell her it's for your son, you know, he wanted, uh, you know, two entrees, and anyway, so um, it was a good time, uh, we went out to Bend, Oregon, I don't know if y'all have been out there, but it's, uh, it's pretty nice out there, we had never been, it was really nice, we went out to, uh, it was actually 4th of July weekend, uh, we went to Kalispell, Montana, I don't know what it is about about Montana, but when I say it, I want to say Montana. It just seems like that's the way to say it. Um, yeah, Fourth of July weekend, I was feeling extra red, white, and blue. I picked up a cowboy's hat, or a cowboy hat, like the real thing, and uh, it was pretty awesome. We got a picture of it. Can you see that? Ooh, boy, look at that. Yeah, yeah. So it was... Uh, I was feeling it, definitely. That's a little uh, fishing rod holder that uh, Christian and I made, and at the end of it, actually, it has an uh, American flag that I cut out like a bass, and so we call it, you know, um, what did we call it, actually? I just, you know, so you we're going down the freeway, and it's like this. I'm like, America. Yeah, so that's good stuff. That's actually, so that trip to Kalispell is like eight and a half hours, and um so I wanted to break it up, and we went to stay at our in-laws' place in Lake Roosevelt, um, and they got toys like this, uh, doing some fishing. They even have um, a, uh, a setup where you can hit golf balls into the lake. Uh, I don't want to hear about littering and stuff like that. It's, uh, it, was a, it was a fun time. It was a fun time. So... Um, we, uh, we spent the night there, broke up the trip, and then early in the morning, we headed out to Montana. We ended up, um, what did we do? Well, we did some fishing. We saw the fireworks and stuff, and then our team, uh, or our teams, we had two teams there, our uh, Christian's team and another team, and we took first and third, so uh, it was kind of like we came, we saw, we conquered, and then we were heading back home. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but uh, I'm going to come back to that story, and we're going to talk about that ride back home uh, in a little bit. First, I want to tell you guys about uh, uh, a man named King Saul. So last week, we were talking about uh, legacy. What was it? Legacy and legends? Yes, I think that's what it is. And uh, we were talking about how the Israelites were demanding that uh, God would give them a king like all the other nations. And um, God was warning them about this king. And uh, what it would be like, and uh, we were saying, be careful what you wish for, right? Remember that? So the Israelites insisted, and God gave them the king that they demanded, and his name was Saul. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10, uh, we won't uh, put them on the screen, but uh, Scripture paints a picture of who Saul was when he began to serve as king, and it's all pretty much good stuff in the beginning. Um, it says that he was humble. He was anointed. Uh, God had given him a new heart, and God's spirit had uh, come upon him, and he was able to prophesy uh, to the people. Uh, his physical stature was admired because he was so tall and handsome. He had Samuel, uh, we talked about Samuel, uh, as his personal advisor, and to top it off, uh, God had said of him, you and your family are the focus of all of Israel's hopes. So, I mean, he kind of, he had these qualifications. God hooked him up with a little more favor, and uh, things were going good. So Saul's the man, the one God had chosen to uh, lead his people. And yet, speaking of legacy, King Saul did not leave a great one. In fact, he was removed as king by God. So the question is, what in the world happened? What went wrong? 
in chapters 13 through 15 of 1 Samuel, it tells us about Saul's rejection. And we won't go through and read them all now. Um, they include two big examples of Saul being disobe- disobedient and prideful. So in chapter 13, it tells us about how Saul had been instructed to wait for Samuel to seek, for, uh, seek guidance uh, from God before going into battle. Seven days had passed, and maybe it's a guy thing, not just a Saul thing, but we're like, okay, come on, man, let's go. Uh, Saul was getting anxious. He was getting worried. Uh, he wouldn't wait for Samuel to do a burnt offering to God so that they could get those directions that they wanted. Uh, so he did it himself. And back then, that was a big deal because nobody but p- people in the position like Samuel were able to do that. So he broke a custom on top of all those things. And uh, Samuel gets there. He confronts Saul, and Saul makes a whole bunch of excuses about how they were run out of time and they had no choice. Otherwise, uh, they were going to lose the battle. Saul screwed up. He was impatient. He didn't fear God. And he had done something he knew was wrong. But that isn't the deal breaker for God. That wasn't the deal breaker for God. In chapter 14, it tells us about how Saul's army is being pressed to the point of exhaustion because Saul had made all of the soldiers make a vow that they would not eat before they had won the battle or they would be put to death. This wasn't a vow to God. This was a foolish and arrogant vow in order to motivate his army to win the battle faster. Instead, it almost cost him the battle because his men were too exhausted from lack of food to keep fighting. And it almost cost him his son Jonathan's life because Jonathan didn't get the memo. He ate something, and uh, Saul found out about it. It was a big big ordeal. So, again, Saul screwed up, he made a bad call, likely out of pride and arrogance, and it almost cost him both the battle he was fighting as well as his own son. But, are these bad enough mistakes to be rejected as king? I mean, all of us make a mistake, so if that making a mistake was, you know, reason to be rejected by God, we'd all be in trouble. So, in chapter 15 we find the answer we're looking for. The first six verses describe God's clear instructions to Saul, and they're essentially Saul's second chance to be obedient to God's assignment for him. He was to go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation and leave nothing and no one alive. So, what did Saul do? Let's read 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 9. It says... Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the Amalekite king, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless of poor quality, or poor, of poor quality. Saul screwed up. Again, he disobeyed God's instructions clearly, but is that really why God rejected him? So I want us to consider that rejection would have been because of Saul's lies, that he pointed blame, and he made excuses. In other words, he didn't own up to his mistakes. And you'll hear this uh, clearly in these next verses. They're a little long, but please... Try to follow along because it points it out pretty clearly. So 1 Samuel 15, 12 through 23, it says, Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. So when Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. It's true that the army, the blame, right? The army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked. 
And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the, Lord, in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops, pointing blame, brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness is bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. There it is. So now let me continue telling you about our trip back home from Montana. So we're driving along and I get a phone call. It's my father-in-law. And he says, hey, buddy, uh, mind you, we have a really great relationship, um, my father-in-law and I. And he says, uh, I want to talk to you about your guys' stay over here at the property he says, uh, I just got here and my wife can't find the new golf club that uh, I bought her for her birthday. Wondering if you guys saw it or you happened uh, to use it and put it somewhere. I said, uh, I didn't pay attention to any golf clubs. Let me ask Christian and see if he knows anything. Christian, did you see a brand new looking golf club with the white head on it? He said, yeah, I used it. I put it back behind the uh, front door where I found it. I told my father-in-law, yeah. Uh, Christian was hitting some balls with it, and he says he put it back where he got it from, uh, behind the front door. My father-in-law says, yeah, that's where we left it, but we're here now, and we can't find it anywhere. I uh, was thinking maybe someone came in. He's thinking somebody maybe came into the house and took it. But he said all of his other valuables are there, and so he was going to go talk to the neighbors. I got off, with, uh, off the phone with him, and Christian and I started to talk about it. I said, dang, man. Not good. Are you sure you put it back? Yeah, I think Grandpa Vic thinks one of his neighbors stole it. So out there in Lake Roosevelt, like, there's only so many neighbors, right? And they kind of talk to each other and know what's going on. But um, Christian says, well, actually, it's by the dumpster. I was hitting balls with it, and I snapped it in half. And I said, bro, you lied? Why did you lie? Grandpa Vic is tripping out. He thinks that somebody came and stole it. He's about to go interrogate his neighbors. And we could have settled this right away. Or you could have told me when you broke it and we would have replaced it and told them what happened. It's not about breaking the club because the club can be replaced. It's about lying. Not cool, son. They opened up their home and they trusted us, man. You got to make this right with Grandpa Vic. <laughs> I tell you, that eight and a half hour trip back, it seemed a lot longer after all that. So we get home and I said, leave everything in the car. Let's go and call Grandpa Vic. So I'm setting up the phone and I'm about to FaceTime. Grandpa Vic, and Christian starts freaking out. He's like, what, FaceTime? Come on, man. You're going to face, he says, you're going to FaceTime him? And I said, uh, that's right. We're going to FaceTime him because you're going to look at him in the face and you're going to tell him what happened and you're going to apologize to him. So I FaceTime Grandpa Vic. Hey, Vic. So Christian and I were talking more about the club and he's got something to say. So Christian begins to speak and he just gets all choked up, right? And he explains what happened and apologizes. Grandpa Vic, he starts to speak, and he gets all choked up. I'm in the background. I'm all choked up. 
just letting them have this conversation. And Grandpa Vic says to Christian, it's not about the club because the club can be replaced. It's about the lie. You need to recognize that this is sin. It's wrong, and you need to repent of this, confess, and own up to your mistake. Recognize that this leads to pain and harder consequences. And he says, I'm a man that has been forgiven for many sins. Forgiven by others, and mostly, most importantly, forgiven by the blood of Jesus. As I have been forgiven, I also forgive. I love you, and I accept your apology. So the definition of obedience from the Bible is to hear God's word and act accordingly. The thing is, Christian had an opportunity. It was a quick moment, but a moment nonetheless. It was an opportunity to hear God and act accordingly. To be obedient, to do the right thing, tell the truth, and don't hide what you've done. What are we hiding? Most importantly, what are we hiding from God? So we're going to go right into communion. And I want us to go ahead and take out the little wafer and open up the cup. The FaceTime call, that was a picture of grace. But these elements... They represent the greatest grace that we could ever receive. Scripture says in Matthew 26, 26 through 28, says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's just go ahead and take the bread and drink from the cup. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads and I'm going to pray for us. Father God, thank you for the most magnificent, incredible, awesome, greatest display of grace by giving us your son, body broken, blood shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins before we even came into this world, God. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done for us. Willingly, obediently, laying down your life for the forgiveness of our sins. Allowing for your body to be broken and take our punishment for our sins, God. Thank you for what you have done that has brought us in good standing with our Heavenly Father, reconciled us to him, giving us now the opportunity to hear him, to speak to him, that he would respond to us and we would listen. Father, help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to hear you more clearly. Help us when we are in the midst, in that crossroads, God. And we have options of which way to go. Lord, quiet our soul. Help us, God, to hear you clearly. Do the right thing. Honor you with our life, God. In everything. In every way, God. Golf clubs, 
are not too small. And even the greatest mistake, God, is not greater than the grace that you have for us. Help us, God. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.